When God says, uh, don't, he means don't hurt yourself. Choose to sin, choose to suffer. And when God says you have to forgive, that affects you at every level, the decision not to do that. This is what happened to you, okay? And so now we're gonna have a discussion about whether you should carry this around for the rest of your life or whether you should have the funeral and be done with it. That's the discussion right now. So jump up here for a second and help me with my coat because I'm just gonna kind of put this on my shoulder here. All right, so help me with my coat. Just gotta get inside my coat, ready? All right, something like, like this. All right. How do I look? See if I can button up here. Help me button up a bit. Okay. Should I carry this around for the rest of my life? Five common rationalizations for putting the tumor of unforgiveness under my coat forever. Five common rationalizations. Number one, I can't forgive this because it's too big. That's my reason. All the more reason not to carry it. The bigger the issue, the harder the forgiveness, the more it must be done. The bigger it is, the more you don't want to carry it. Not the less. Second rationalization is very uncomfortable. <laughs> Time will heal it. Time will heal it. I'm going to flip some pages on the calendar. I'm going to ignore it, and it will go away. What my father did, what my mother did, what my sister did, what my boss did, what my college professor did, what, 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 whatever my story is, time is my plan. Jot this down. Time heals nothing. It's still in there. It's just as sensitive and sore as it used to be. You can avoid it, you can push it away, but someday you'll be at the mall, you'll be walking somewhere, you'll come into church, you'll be at a concert somewhere, you'll be out on the street and you will bump into that person and you will find out it is just as sore and just as oozing and just as sick as it ever was. It's not healing. The hurt's too big, time will heal it. I'll forgive when they say they're sorry. I'll get rid of this when the other person comes and tells me they're sorry. But until then, I'm gonna carry this with me everywhere I go. Until the person comes and says they're sorry. Uh, newsflash. Jot this down, they're not coming. They're not coming. And if they came and you were on this plan, you wouldn't be ready to receive them. If by God's grace, a miracle happened and they saw and understood what they did and came and asked for forgiveness, if you were like this, you'd blow it. You're not ready to embrace. You're not ready to exchange. You're not ready to be restored. No. Five common rationalizations. The hurt's too big. Time will heal it. I'll forgive when they say sorry. Four. I can't forgive if I can't forget. Um, that is completely backwards. I can't forgive if I can't forget. No, no. You can't forget until you forgive. That's the truth. Unforgiveness is the decision to regularly review the offense. Unforgiveness is the decision to keep looking at it, keep feeling it, bear with the discomfort. You will never, ever forget until you begin that process by forgiving. Forgiving is the process of getting it out and releasing it and beginning the healing. 
And lastly, but if I forgive, they'll just do it again. If I forgive them, they're just going to do it again. Oh, you mean you might have to carry two of these? Well, it seemed to me then that that would be a, a huge motivation for getting rid of the first one. More about people who continue to sin, sin against us in a moment. So, uh, the rationalizations are foolish. Why don't people forgive? The, ra the rationalizations are foolish. And then this, jot it down. The fallout is huge. The fallout is huge. Unforgiveness punishes everyone in its path. I've said in the past, unforgiveness cuts a swath of destruction across your life like a tornado across a Kansas wheat field. Unforgiveness cuts a path of destruction across your life. The fallout is huge. Just look at the fallout in this story. As bad as the situation was with the king, he walked, he walked out forgiven. He walked out in incredible position considering what he had done. And he took it and made it so much worse so fast by wanting the forgiveness of the king. Who's the king in the story? God. By wanting the forgiveness of the king, but not wanting to extend that to others, he proved that he had never really experienced the forgiveness of the king, and he ended up with neither. With neither. Look at the fallout. Number one, uh, his mental meltdown. He throws a friend in prison. He in the story, he starts choking the guy. Notice, let me... When that same servant went out, verse 28, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him. Okay, so come on up here, Dan. You're in the sermon now. So, everyone cheer. I've just been forgiven by the king. <laughs> there was no, hey, how are you? There was no, um, hey, we have some things we need to talk through. There was no, hey, do you have that uh, 10 bucks you borrowed? There was nothing like that. Look at the text. He, and seeing him, he seized him and began to choke him. It was immediate. All right? Now that shows his heart had not changed. His heart had not changed. He was not impacted by the forgiveness that he had received. And his conduct toward his fellow servant was proof of that. A total meltdown. Notice secondly, shattered, shattered relationship. So the mental meltdown, as already stated, the shattered relationship with his fellow servant. I mean, they must have been friends at one point. He, he loaned him money. There must have been a time where the fellow servant had come and said, hey, can you lend me a few bucks? I'm kind of short this month. And the answer was, yes, I can. Here it is. He reached out and gave it to him. He cared for him. He, maybe he loved him. He, he certainly valued the relationship to extend a loan to him. But now the relationship is, of course, shattered, as unforgiveness always does, shatter relationships. And then the totally trashed relationship with his coworkers, they're so disgusted, they go and narc on him. Do you notice in the text? And it says, when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were distressed and reported to the master all that had taken place. So unforgiveness has ancillary fallout. Unforgiveness affects others. Look up here. It's not just you and the person you won't forgive. It's all the people in your life that know you claim to be a follower of Jesus who are watching the fact that you can't let that go, all right, and judging the reality of your faith in Christ based on how that filters down to other people. So the fallout here was just massive. He melts down, he shatters the relationship with his fellow servant, he trashes the relationship with the co-workers. And then, of course, the worst part of it all is the humiliation before the king. Look at the text and tell me, what does the wicked servant say when he comes in the second time? What does he say? 
Hold up the universal symbol for what he says. He says nothing. And why does he say nothing? Because there's nothing to say. Knowing what you know about the gospel, knowing what I know about the gospel, God forbid I should ever have to stand in front of Jesus Christ and offer an explanation for why I haven't forgiven. What would, what would I say? There's nothing to say. And he has nothing to say. And we have nothing to say. So, of course, it isn't just how it affects our soul. Much could be said about this. A recent study uh, by Worthington and Shear used in MRI scans and found that unforgiveness has a similar effect on the brain as anger. They also found that hormonal patterns of an unforgiving person mimic that of a person who's under stress. In another uh, study, uh, Spears found that unforgiveness on the part of the victim correlates with the development of psychiatric disorders. There have been about 60 conclusive studies that show a clear connection between the health of your body and the effects of unforgiveness. In one study, vengeful thoughts for as little as 16 seconds led to an increase in blood pressure, heart rate, muscle tension. I could go on and read these studies for 20 minutes. I don't want to spend our time on that. I think you all believe God's word. When God says uh, don't, he means don't hurt yourself. Choose to sin, choose to suffer. And when God says you have to forgive, that affects you at every level, the decision not to do that. That's what the cross is all about. It has to be paid. And just as it had to be paid by the Son to satisfy the Father, so the debt has to be paid by someone. It can't just be unpaid. And if someone has sinned against you, you pay. I think you know that I live in the city of Chicago. People talk about survival skills, you know, in the big areas with so many people. You know, you got to know how to drive aggressively and you got to know how to sort of manage risk when you're in certain areas of the city. This is the survival skill. You are not going to make it to the finish line unless you learn to forgive. The survival skill of learning to forgive. If you don't need it today, you're gonna need it really soon. If you don't need it this month, you're gonna need it by the end of this quarter. Everyone following Jesus inevitably has to learn this survival skill. Do you know how to forgive? Call Walk in the Word right now. And as our thanks for supporting this ministry, we will send you Freedom Through Forgiveness, Moving Past Your Past. This collection includes Pastor James's most comprehensive single message on the subject of forgiveness as well as a booklet that walks you through each step in the process of forgiving. And because we want you to actually apply that process, we're also including a forgiveness card for you to fill out and mail back to us so we can put to rest once and for all the offenses you've been carrying and the hurt you've been harboring. I choose to forgive the name of the person, name the person, name the pain, name the person, name the pain, fill out the card, send it here. We will bury it with our own and we will move on together into the joy and freedom that God gives to those who really live out this biblical teaching on forgiveness. It's time to get serious about the most important survival skill of all. Ask for freedom through forgiveness when you call or go online today. And if you're looking for some extra encouragement from God's Word, you can also request Walk in the Word's 2016 Scripture Calendar and Leather Journal. Get yours now for a gift of $85 or more when you call 800-545-6800 or go to jamesmcdonald.tv. This is a message uh, entitled, uh, The Wake, Viewing Unforgiveness as God Does. The rationalizations are fo foolish, the fallout is huge, and finally, the consequences are lasting. The consequences are lasting. Notice in the text, and in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers. Uh, jailers, uh, in the text, uh, speaks of those who have a punishment as their vocation until he should pay all his debt. Suffering to pay was what you chose. The king didn't choose that. The servant chose that. I want to suffer and pay for what I've done. I don't want forgiveness. Not in me, not through me, not me. And clearly you can't have the one without the other. 
His master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So how's that going to go for you? You have a debt that you can't pay, and you're in jail. How much do you make in jail again? Back then, I'm going to tell you nothing. Nothing. So the situation was completely unaltered eternally. And again, this point, so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you, no exceptions, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Now, simply, God means what he says. God means what he says. Lovingly, I say to you, to myself, to all of us, God means what he says. This is not a mix-up. This is not a misprint. This is not needing revision. God doesn't regret it. It's God's truth. It's eternal. It's unchanging. God means what he says. Just as an unforgiving servant was handed over to the torturers, so here today, the unforgiving spouse, the unforgiving parent, the unforgiving child, the unforgiving sibling, the unforgiving employee, the unforgiving church member, the unforgiving Christian will be put into a prison of personal torture that will last as far into the future as you remain unrepentant. And if you get to the end of your life in that condition, it is then unalterable. So not just in this life, but in the life to come. Again, Matthew 6, 14, if you forgive others, my Father in heaven will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, my Father in heaven will not forgive you. James 2.13 is a verse that I memorized very early in the history of Harvest. James 2.13 says, judgment is without mercy to the one who shows no mercy. Mercy is the, grace is getting what we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. And when we show mercy to another person, we choose to not give them what they deserve. I'm sure you have lots of things in your mind right now about what people deserve. And showing mercy is choosing to not give them what they deserve. Judgment is without mercy to the one who shows no mercy. Blessed are the merciful. All right. Unforgiveness is cancer of the soul. If you want God to bless and heal and restore your life, your marriage, your family. Forgiveness is the beginning. A few practical thoughts about forgiveness before I close. Let's be very specific what we mean by forgiveness. First, the definition. Forgiveness is a decision to release a person from the obligation that resulted when they injured me. That's it. I choose to release you from the obligation that resulted from my injuring you. I've used so many illustrations of this through the years. If I lunged at you and took your Bible from you while you were writing on the piece of paper and just said, and I took this from you, clearly now I owe you. And your forgiveness would be the decision to release me from the obligation that resulted when I injured you. You took, you said, you did, you injured, you owe. And I release you from what you owe. I used to say that um, you don't require payment, but I think as I've reflected deeper and deeper upon forgiveness, uh, in reality what you do is you pay yourself. You pay the debt. If you took respect from me, if you took dignity from me, if you took purity from me, if you took anything from me that belonged to me, I have to, with God's grace and with the support of my brothers and sisters, I have to pay what you owe. It has to be paid. It, it can't simply, that's what the cross is all about. It has to be paid. And just as it had to be paid by the Son to satisfy the Father, so the debt has to be paid by someone. It can't just be unpaid. And if someone has sinned against you, you pay. You pay. You absorb it, you cover it, you get beyond it, you pull it up yourself and deal with it and get past it without them. You pay. Forgiveness is a decision to release a person from the obligation that resulted when they injured me. Quickly, forgiveness is not enabling. My mother has an overspending problem. She's often 
uh, used uh, money in a way that's very destructive to her and to others. I can forgive her for what she did without giving her a credit card. All right, I don't have to help the person do it again. Forgiving is not enabling. Secondly, forgiving is not rescuing. My 14-year-old son um, uh, shows uh, immense unkindness and disrespect to our family. He took our car out for a ride and he drove it into a tree and he destroyed it. And, and now we have the debt on the car and we don't have the car. And, and um, you can forgive him, uh, but he may need to go get a job to help pay for that, to learn some things. You don't, forgiveness does not require rescuing. I don't have to rescue you to forgive you. I don't have to enable you to help you do it. I don't have to rescue you from the consequences of your bad choices to forgive. And furthermore, I don't have to risk. My father's a very angry, violent man. When he drinks and gets drunk, he hurts me very badly. I can forgive him for that without accepting his invitation to the New Year's Eve party. Forgiveness does not require enabling or rescuing or risking. Forgiveness is just this. You don't owe me. I'm not trying to get even. I'm not hoping for vengeance. I'm not focused on your failure. But in God's grace, I'm moving beyond what has happened. Okay? So, um, here's what we're going to do. I want you to think and pray about these two points. I forgive, write this sentence down, I forgive name for circumstance. I forgive name for circumstance. It's a decision, it's a choice. All right? Let's all stand. Now let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the clarity of your word. It is not possible that this truth is lost on anyone. What remains is the convicting work of your spirit in our hearts. Help each treasured person here to rightly estimate the price that is paid for unforgiveness. And grip our hearts afresh with what our heavenly father thinks about this. Thank you that with the command to do something difficult comes the grace to do it. Thank you that we are not left without the resource to make the choice that is right. And I pray for every yielded heart a crisis of forgiveness. Some things need to be left behind. Some things need freedom and release. We need to get on into all of the good that you have for us. So bring us to that place of decision. Bring us to that place of finality. And give us the courage to do what is right. Help us. Help us. Prepare our hearts for a weekend of great victory ahead. What I'm praying, I'm praying in the great name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching Walk in the Word TV and the series we're doing, Have the Funeral. Now, Mom, I wanted you on the program. We have you on the program all the time, but sometimes I feel like maybe Dad says a little bit too much. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and I know that you have had just a lot in your own life. I mean, I would imagine that you would think, man, like, Going through ministry, this has been such a key concept, this concept of forgiveness. It really has. We've been in ministry for um, 30 some years and I yeah. don't think I would have ever known just how important the concept and the reality in my yeah. life of truly forgiving and moving on. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's easy also for a viewer who doesn't know our family personally to look at you and be like, oh man, like that must have been really easy. There must have not mm -hmm. been any big forgivenesses or any difficult things in your life or in your childhood. Well, I'm grateful that when Dad and I got married that we um, had put a lot of those things in the past. Of course, he's kept us practicing, but, um, you know, even uh, my childhood, you know, was full of a lot of crazy dysfunction. I know that's a big word now, and 
I think I went to 14 schools before I was yeah. finished high school and uh, just crazy. a constant before I knew the Lord even yeah. just the constant reality of forgiving and moving on yeah. and um, but God is so good and That's when good. you open your arms up and say I need I need your help Lord yeah, yeah he's Isn't been able awesome? to do that mm -hmm. and it's great for you to yeah. know at home that it doesn't matter what's happened in your life whatever's happened you can have the funeral yeah. you can grant the forgiveness and you can move on in God's providence for your life. Good. Call Walk in the Word right now, and as our thanks for supporting this ministry, we will send you Freedom Through Forgiveness, Moving Past Your Past. This collection includes Pastor James's most comprehensive single message on the subject of forgiveness, as well as a booklet that walks you through each step in the process of forgiving. And because we want you to actually apply that process, we're also including a forgiveness card for you to fill out and mail back to us so we can put to rest once and for all the offenses you've been carrying and the hurt you've been harboring. It's time to get serious about the most important survival skill of all. Ask for freedom through forgiveness when you call or go online today. And if you're looking for some extra encouragement from God's Word, you can also request Walk in the Word's 2016 Scripture Calendar and Leather Journal. Get yours now for a gift of $85 or more when you call 800-545-6800 or go to jamesmcdonald.tv. Well, we wanted to say thank you for tuning in to Walk in the Word TV, and uh, we're here together to say thank yeah. you for watching. And oh, to be here's, with you, here's Dad. Hey, Dad. Oh, how, there. how come you guys There's didn't tell me that you were you were recording <laughs> programs today? Did I? Uh, did you lay me off? Am I out? No. We wanted to give you a little break Goodness, and just no. take care of some of these. Yeah. It would have been nice if you had said something. <laughs> You're always welcome. You're always welcome. <laughs> I'm working on forgiveness, and uh, you get to the place where you can laugh about even the most painful things. This isn't one of them, <laughs> but I know they exist. Yes, and uh, so check with us next time mm -hmm. on all this. All right, have the funeral. This program was paid for by the friends and partners of Walk in the Word.